So let's say someone is like playing completely average, but they're putting insanely well. Like they keep putting, and like so, like there's their overall strokes gained is quite good, but it's all coming from putting. Welcome to another episode of Football Analytics Show. My name is Ed Fang, your host. And on the show, my guest is Will Corshane. He is the founder of Data Golf with his brother, Matt. Among other topics in this episode, we talk about how they do predictive analytics for golf. Then Will tells us about their predictions for the U.S. Open at the Los Angeles Country Club. We get into the golfer that's hitting the ball like Tiger Woods and also the problem with making predictions for Brooks Kepka at majors. The Football Analytics is brought to you by the Power Ranks Sports Betting Newsletter. This is a free service that strives to be three things. One, valuable. Two, concise. Three, entertaining. Every Saturday, I send out a curated list of sports betting tips and analytics. To get this free service, go to thepowerrank.com. That is my site for better sports betting information through data and analytics. Once again, that's thepowerrank.com. Joining me on this episode of the podcast is Will Corshane. He is the founder of the awesome data analytics site, Data Golf. Will, welcome to the show. Hey, hey, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time, especially in this busy week before the U.S. Open. Well, I'd first like to know a little bit more about your story. How did you get started with datagolf.com? Um, and just maybe give a little bit more about your background as well. Yeah, so really, <clears throat> I guess it started just me and Matt, my brother. He's two years older than me. Um, we just grew up playing golf every day up in Canada and uh well in the summer at least so yeah that was kind of like our childhood basically which is golf we were obsessed and then we both were doing economics in graduate school um and then I had finished my master's and was just trying to like kind of just like use the skills I had learned on like some data so I could like get a job basically just say like look at what I'm doing kind of mm -hmm. yeah and then we just threw it on Matt's personal website so for a while, we were just mattcrushane.com. And then, yeah, Matt came in. And like back in those days, you could just get all of the PGA Tour data through your academic email. So if you were with a legitimate like university, you could get all of the shot link data. So we were basically just messing around with that and started a really bad blog. Um, <laughs> and then from there, we just kind of grew. We started a Twitter account and like we just back then twitter was much more tame i would say uh and like the golf <laughs> community on twitter was more smaller and like they weren't all like these live accounts <laughs> hanging around um <laughs> it was yeah. a much simpler time and then yeah so we kind of grew through that and then yeah the name was just anything with datas and golf we were just looking for any kind of account that existed and right. stumbled on data golf which kind of I still don't even really know what it means, but it kind of has been accepted. Um, and they, yeah, DG works as well, I guess. But yeah, the name is a bit questionable, but it's been so long now that can't change it. <laughs> right. I think data golf completely makes sense for what you guys do. You guys grab all the data. You do some awesome analytics to make predictions and have honestly become one of the leaders in the space. Which which is which is awesome. Yeah, well, the other thing me. with oh sorry. No, yeah, I was just gonna say the other thing with data golf is just we always wanted to make sure that we weren't like a betting or a fantasy company first. So it, what did go into the name, at least initially, was just like let's not be like I don't know, like uh like like golfbetting dot com or something. Like we always wanted to be like golf focused. So yeah, it's it's been weird to think back now but that was always like a, a thought to to make it like make sure like people come here and they think golf first not like uh, dfs or something like that for sure what year did you guys start data golf 
Oh yeah, I should, probably should have mentioned. Uh, I think it was like the blog started in like 2017. So yeah, it's been a, quite a long time now. But our subscription product and like when we actually started creating uh, like predictions each week, that was more like 20, 20, 2019, 2018, 2019. Right. So my guess is that Twitter was tamer back then because all the betters hadn't started betting as much on golf. So it's really like the sports betting people on Twitter that have messed up Twitter golf. Do you think that's true? Uh, maybe. I mean, we stay out of betting <laughs> Twitter quite a lot. For us, it's more like the live golf accounts that are really oh, muddying right. the waters. Um, right, right. But uh, I mean, honestly, initially, we didn't start data golf with betting in mind at all. We had never bet in our life before. So and we actually were like kind of taken aback at how interested the betting community was in our stuff. Like they were much more like when we're talking about like the fractions of a shot adjustment we should be making for someone based on like how they played at the course previously. It wasn't the golf community that was interested in that at all. It was all, it was just like the gambling people were the ones who were reading the blog posts and stuff. So yeah, we, I would say it, not, Maybe not so much now, but initially, yeah, we we had a very positive thought of the gambling community just because they were interested in the details that we were kind of putting in our blogs. I think uh, that I had kind of a similar trajectory that you guys had. So in 2012, I started doing football analytics. And I think back then I was kind of more interested in like just kind of the pure analytics. Like I was a football person and I definitely love sports, but... I thought analytics was just kind of a smart way to look at football. And I remember talking to someone being like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to create this like content site. That's going to be the economist for football and, and football analytics. And then very clearly it becomes obvious that the betters care about this. And it's been an mm -hmm. interesting journey over a decade, right? Uh, evolving from sports and just sports analytics to, well, okay, well <laughs> pretty much what I do is, is football betting now because you know, that's kind of where the market is. Right. So but I do yeah. respect that you guys do have that passion for golf. You have like the hardcore academic background to to do the predictive analytics and, and good things happen there. Yeah. And the nice thing for us, which wouldn't have been possible in others, like a lot of people have asked us, like, why don't you guys do this for like football? Or, I mean, firstly, we don't know nearly as much about football as we do about golf. Like, um, but also like, there's so much more like golf was kind of like a void in terms of like a statistics based website that was like publicly available with like no subscription. So yeah, that that was also keeping us motivated to not just go the strictly betting route and like paywall everything just because we could be like the first kind of general golf stats website. So yeah. And I don't know, it's hard to say like we do like golf so much It'd be hard to imagine paywalling everything if it was only gambling, but yeah, who knows? I mean, I think you guys have a great blend of a lot of stuff outside the paywall, um, like a lot of stuff that people can just reference, anyone who's a fan of sport, trying to bet on stuff, but then a lot of the hardcore stuff is behind the paywall, and I use it a lot. So people like me who want to do that stuff, want to you know help their betting, uh, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good blend. Yeah, it is when, a tough balance just to act or just it's a tough balance just because like golf fans don't want to be like spammed by betting content. And then the betters don't want to be like seeing this like weird golf piece that has not really <laughs> related to actual betting. So, yeah, it's, it's we have to kind of separate things, but we try and try and make it work. Excellent. When did like the the golf data and the shot link stuff like when did that first start? happening uh yeah i mean so mark brody kind of when he came up with him and his co-author um they came up with strokes gained i don't know when but it got implemented around like 2008 or something but they had been collecting like individual shot data back to from 2004 so that's kind of like 2004 is like when all of like anytime someone gives you like a strokes gained stat it's always going to be like since 2004 because that's when <clears throat> kind of we got that extra layer of data outside of just like how many fairways you hit and how many greens you hit. Um, 
but yeah, so that it's been around for a long time, but I feel like in the last few years, it's really been accepted more. I think more people understand it now. And uh, yeah, I think like any sport, it's just going to like just takes a bit of time. And like the first time you see something, it's not going to stick. You kind of have to be beaten over the head with it before you kind of start taking notice. For sure. You started the site with your brother, Matt. Matt was on the show a year ago. And maybe give us a sense for how you guys work together and, and then maybe what aspects of the site that uh, you do more of and Matt does more of. Yeah. So to start, we were just both kind of on the pure data side, but then we didn't have a website that we, we were just on like a WordPress thing. So I slowly started moving over into like web development and mostly just data visualization to start. Just like, how can we present this in a way that's like, different or more interactive than just like a like a gg plot or like a like a plot from r or an excel file that was something we for some reason we cared a lot about that i mean you said you were um i can't you said you were inspired by uh the economist right but we were like i was inspired by the economist i guess yeah yeah so but like we really looked at 538 and we're like we should be doing that for golf like that's it just seems so obvious and they're like visualization their data viz is obviously pretty good um so yeah slowly over time we've just kind of moved into like i mean the data is like messy and so we're, we're both involved in like collecting and like making sure the data is like updated properly each week and like all the all the players are like matching and uh like the ids like our id system is all that's like the core of kind of what that's like most most of the things we do come from like yeah just making sure like if this guy's playing on this tour, he's matching over here. Or this amateur just turned pro. We need to link his amateur data with his pro, with his new pro ID, and like so. There's all those links. We got to keep track of each week. But then, yeah, in terms of the model, like Matt does the large majority of the modeling now, and then I am just strictly just creating the website and making sure everything's coming through in the in the right way. Um, yeah, it kind of I don't know when that actually fully. We were kind of like Matt was doing. We were kind of like mixing it up and then eventually it just didn't make any sense Like we were both too much in our own thing like matt didn't want me messing around with his stuff and like i see like i will go on my computer one day and see matt's like messing around with one of the pages and it's not working and it's just like (laughs) you need to stop like just get out of here yeah so now it's really we we still collaborate on a lot of stuff but like in terms of actually doing it's like matt's the modeling and then i'm basically presenting everything which i think I think just it works just in terms of our personalities more. Like I definitely like creating stuff more. And then Matt is a pretty like, I wouldn't say like he's, he's really detail oriented and like he, I guess his form of like creation is just like the, the model itself. So yeah, I think it, it kind of works. Um, and it's nice only having two of us for something that's so it's like sprawling, like with all the IDs and stuff that I mentioned, it's, it's good to have it contained. Like we've, we've considered hiring someone and we are going to, I think, but yeah, it's going to be hard to bring someone in just because it's been such a mess basically. And like we keep building without reinforcing. <laughs> so yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, we, it, it works. And I don't know, at this point it's, it's going to be tough to bring someone in, but yeah, we are going to try and do it. Excellent. So, well, we got some big news last week about the merger between the PGA and Liv. Uh, maybe give us your thoughts, both from an emotional perspective and then a data standpoint. Uh, yeah, I mean, from an emotional and I like politics aside, I guess, we'll just be the disclaimer. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, just the golf side of Liv. I mean, I already hinted at it earlier with the Liv people on Twitter. It's just, I don't know, as like someone who grew up playing golf, to me, like, golf is like an individual 72 holes uh it sport and like i think the pga tour has is presenting golf and it's in like the best way it can considering they aren't majors i know like some people think it can be like different or like look at the f1 model like there should be like all these teams and stuff and like trades but i don't know like for for me like when i watch a golf tournament i just want to know like who's the best player this week and like a tournament should I should identify that like a good example for me is like the Canadian Open last week is like our national open like we want to identify the best player that week I don't really want a team aspect involved and none of this isn't like so the merger I just want to make 
as long as the PJ Tour maintains control, I think I'm okay with it from a golf perspective. Um, just because like the live broadcast, when you were watching them, there's like music in the background, and like the announcers are like spewing propaganda almost in terms of like, like you won't believe how many people are here, and like this is the happiest I've ever seen Patrick Reed in my life. It's just like I don't. Why do I feel like I'm like, why, like what am I watching right now? Is kind of how I felt, and <clears throat> yeah, I think that's the one thing that me and Matt don't really like there is a lot of people saying that the pj tour needs to change their like what they put out in terms of their product but i I think golf like inherently is pretty boring it's just like it's just something you kind of keep tabs on from thursday to sunday and then sometimes sunday is really really exciting if you like invest the time from thursday on to like kind of follow along i don't think it's ever going to be f1 where like the flag drops and it's just like pure chaos. It's at the end of the day, it's just like pretty boring people just like moseying around a golf course, like trying to just be like as emotionless as possible. Cause that's like the optimal state of mind to be a golfer. So <clears throat> yeah, I, th- I don't know. I, I mean, it could be wrong. Like maybe the team thing fits in somewhere, but yeah, in terms of the merger, as like the early reports are that the PJ tour is kind of, going to still have control of everything and live is potentially going to die off which i think and then yeah everyone will slowly make their way back to the pga tour which i think is good just because i don't know as much as like some of these guys are unlikable it's still nice to have them around like i like watching bryson play even though he's not personally like my favorite person to root for he's still like an interesting character and he adds a lot to a tournament. So I think like long-term once the dust settles on like these guys took the money and like, we need to be paid for our loyalty to the PJ tour. Once all that stuff settles, I think it'll be better having everyone playing together again. But yeah, the worst outcome would be like live is kind of elevated through this and they get more players from the PJ tour. Yeah. That would be my, my worst outcome. And then from a data side, Again, well, as actually, long as well, PGA let me, Tour... let me just oh yeah, yeah. Just let me stop mm-hmm. you real quick because I wanted to to follow up on some of that stuff, right? Like, does it concern you that like Liv is the sole investor in the new entity that's being formed by the PGA? Uh, it does in the sense that if they control, like if if that gives them like ultimate control of like if you don't let like if you don't do this team thing, we're not going to give you any money and we're going to block any outside money. And we're basically going to force the PJ tour to do stuff. Yeah, that's bad. Just, and this is all just golf, the golfers. Like I know that there's a whole other like Saudi angle here that, yeah, but just strictly talking golf, I think, yeah, if the PJ tour gets the funding they need that they clearly need, I guess. Um, and, and they still have control over their tour. I think golf wise that's that's good yeah the real issue would just be if yeah all of a sudden in a, in a few years we got like spieth and thomas are playing for the cliques or something would be my my worst <laughs> right. case scenario just because i don't know i just don't think of golf in that way and i don't think i don't i just don't think we need to try and force a different sport i know there's, there's been so many comparisons to f1 and like how golf could be like f1 and it's to me, like golf is golf. Like I, there's a reason we all like golf and that's because of what it is. And maybe that's like me just being hesitant to change, but yeah, yeah. I just feel like you can't, you can't make golf exciting from like the first shot to the last shot. It's like, uh, sure. It's, it's more like ebbs and flows and yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can make football exciting from the first pass to the last pass. I think you get an element of excitement just because there's so few games and, there's so much mm-hmm. toll on the body, right? That like the season is so short. When when you say, I'm not an F1 fan, so when you when you draw the comparisons to F1, you know, you said there's a lot of chaos from the start. Like, is is that what you're talking about, or is there like a team element of F1 that I'm missing? Uh, yeah. So I don't actually watch F1 either, but it seems like when the Formula One Netflix series dropped, there was like a shockwave through like the golf world of like. Like, wow, like this is really entertaining. Like, I think golf should have this. Yeah, I guess in F1, there's right. like these, this off, like there's like drama between the teams and like who's going to be racing and like sometimes mm-hmm. teams like sabotage. I, I don't know. I'm like, I don't, I don't watch F1. Right. But yeah, okay. there's like a, 
but I, I just would say I'm would be really careful taking the individual aspect out of golf just because sure. like I can't imagine like like Scotty Scheffler playing really well in a PGA Tour tournament and then not even being a factor. Uh, it just seems mm-hmm. like in golf, it's so individual. Like the, the team isn't going to be like interacting with each other right. in any kind of way like they would in like racing or like right. a more team based like, like football. So I, I, don't, I just, yeah, I don't know. It just goes against like the fabric of what I know golf to be. But again, this is really like there's a lot of people who don't like live who still think there should be a team element in golf and like obviously the Ryder Cup is massive right so it, it can right. work in certain situations I guess I'm just skeptical of like forcing it in through these like made up teams yeah right. I could be wrong totally but that's just our thoughts on it for sure I mean so Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy are starting this like I don't know I, I, I think of it as Monday night golf right they're doing uh there's like a team element to it right and they're playing in a stadium and i guess the idea is like introducing the team element and then also another idea is that as a golf fan you can see every single stroke from your favorite players right because you're doing it in the stadium so i'm I'm guessing you don't like that much yeah i honestly don't know what (laughs) that even like i don't know what they're going for there i think it was like a response to live initially Oh, interesting. And now they still seem to be going through with it. But yeah, I, I don't know what, what that is or what demographic that's serving. Uh, right. Yeah, I don't know who's making those kind of... Dis- Does anybody want that? I don't I don't know. Maybe like the new generation of like the top golf type people and like casual, more casual golfers who are like, would be more into, into that. But yeah, for me, it's just like, like 72 holes, <laughs> just play the... Yeah, like 156 guys, 72 holes. Let's just figure out who's best on this golf course this week, and like that for sure. That's like enough for, for sure. me to, to to cover. Uh, but yeah, I I don't know with the, if the merger is going to change the whole that that league as well. Maybe like live will like merge into that side of things. It might make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's all up in the air right now. I don't think anyone has a good idea seems like even the people who are involved in the deal aren't totally sure what right. it's going to look like. So yeah, at this point we're just going to like, from like me and Matt's like business standpoint, it's kind of like just ignore it basically. And just, <laughs> right. You hope everything, once it settles in a few months, if we need to change stuff, we can change stuff. Uh, yeah. You did say like from the data standpoint. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have been like live has been included in our model. So like we're just, we're, they don't have as many stats and stuff. So we can get like round scores. We have a general idea of how the live guys are playing on weeks, which is important for weeks like the U S open where everyone's together. But yeah. I, I would just, as long as the PJ tour is in control and like, I trust that I know Jay Monahan has been like under fire lately, but I do trust that the PJ tour like somewhat cares about the product that they're putting out. And like, they have invested mm-hmm. a lot of money into shot link and improving like the online coverage of how of of a tournament, which is like how I consume. Like I don't sit and watch golf every Thursday and Friday. For the most part, I'm just on our site or I'm on PJ Tour looking at the shot link stuff. So and that's like a pretty big investment. So as long as that is still being prioritized, then yeah, again, it's totally fine removing like all the politics and like all that side of stuff. And as long as the the PIF isn't being too restrictive with what the PGA tour wants to do. Um, then yeah, it's, it's kind of just business as usual for us. And then hopefully all the players will come together right in a couple of years. Well, the U S open is this week. You guys have predictions up on data golf gives a sense for like broad, you know, kind of 30, 30,000 foot perspective of, of what goes into the model and then what it says for the U S open this week. Yeah, so basically our model, it, everyone has like a, we, we look at everyone's past results and like weight rounds based on like how many rounds ago it was. Um, so basically, in short, we have like a very, each player has a standard deviation and they have a estimate of how good they are at like a neutral PJ Tour course. And that's, um, so that's created just using like, uh, yeah, just historical round scores and then basic weighting that we've like back tested and stuff. So yeah, once we actually look at a certain course, then we make some slight adjustments based on um basic yeah, like how how good a player's suits 
suits the course. So like, I'll, I'll just use this week as an example. So, so the U S open is a major, obviously. Um, so one thing we take into account is, and we didn't used to do this, like Brooks Kapka kind of forced us into this like a few <laughs> right. years ago. Um, basically like, are you somewhat of a different player in majors? So like someone like Will Zalatoris and certainly Brooks, they just simply seem to perform better in majors and we can't capture that in any way. So so we do give bumps in majors uh, just based on your past performance and how many rounds you've played. So someone who would get a negative bump is like Max Homa um, mm-hmm. just because he's like really good on the PGA Tour week in, week out it seems. And then he hasn't performed in majors. Um so yeah, he would get a bit of a negative bump and then yeah, Brooks Kepka would get like a half shot bump because he's, which is a lot, half shot per round is a lot in golf. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, and Jordan Spieth would get like a 0.3. So there are certain players who, for whatever reason, it could be stuff we're not capturing in like course fit, which I'll talk about in a second. Right. Um, it's a kind of a mystery. Like, I don't know. I don't even think Brooks knows why he's so good at majors. Like for a while we thought it was just like, pure luck and like it's going to wear off but he's broken us down to the point where like okay yeah there's probably something that we're not capturing um in any of our other stuff that we shouldn't be including so that's kind of one adjustment we'd make off the baselines there's there's a bunch of other stuff um when if you go to our site we kind of break it all down through our various pages um but then yeah another major one would be course fit so uh yeah it's hard this week because los angeles country club we've never actually seen it before in a professional tournament so we don't have a great idea of how it's going to play uh i mean the one thing with u.s opens that is kind of unique so the other majors are kind of like pga tour events on steroids in the in the sense of like they really reward players who are already kind of good on the pga tour so like like driving distance is more importantly, like the PGA Championship and the, and the Masters, and it, and so when we go to those tournaments, the skill gap of like our overall skill distri- or the skill distribution just kind of widens. Like the better players are better, and uh, the worst players are like worse. So that's why like, uh, but yeah. So, so sorry at the U.S. Open, it's kind of it's not the opposite, but it's not like the other majors. So it's more like the Players Championship where there's more like randomness involved. So the skill distribution is actually compressed in a way. Um, and that could be because of maybe this the US Open is like a different test that we don't see on the PGA Tour. So our skill estimates are kind of, they're not going to be as reflective of performance versus a, a course that's like very PGA Tour like. And it also could just be like, there's like US Open courses are more, uh, like they're typically firm. You might get like weirder bounces, like weather might play more of a role. Just more stuff that kind of like, is like luck based and if it's completely luck then everyone's just like the same so if if we're adding luck in it's just going to compress our our skill distribution so that's like one adjustment we that's kind of where we start from at this week for LACC just because we don't know much about it but we do know that it's 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 a really long course so there are going to be like a lot of long irons and like di- driving distance we did bump it a little bit versus older USO or our baseline US Open fit um just cuz it is so long. Um, yeah, so that's kind of another aspect that we add. And then we also do course history. But again, the LACC, we've never seen it before. So it's kind of a bad week for the adjustments away from the baseline. Um, but right. with all that said, yeah. Our, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, you know, it, it sounds like the the fact that they picked the LA Country Club and that's a little bit of a longer course. Does that mean it's going to be less random than past us opens because driving uh, is a skill. yeah 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 that's kind of what we went for um yeah so if, if we can like identify that this skill is going or this course is going to reward something that we like we really like driving distance is one of like the five characteristics that we really use to define players so if we're gonna if we come to a course that we think is really going to emphasize one of our like main attributes that we set to players uh yeah we'll, we'll definitely see We'll just sorry. I actually forget your initial question. You said it was going to be less random. Well, it it yeah. was going to be less random because the course is a little bit longer, and I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding that right. Yeah, yeah. I guess like if we can, it's 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 weird because like it's because we all of our data is is most of it comes from PJ Tour 
of the players in this field. So like, it's kind of like how similar is the course going to be to like the courses that we kind of create our model based on. So the more similar it's going to be, the more accurate, well, uh, the better idea we'll have of what someone's skill is actually going to be at the course. So yeah, but if they went to like, like the extreme case would be like if the U S open was just like a mini putt and we'd have no idea. And like with like clowns, if it were, sorry, a, a mini what? Like a mini putt, like a putt putt. Oh, oh God. Like, it was just like completely random. Like, like, like that would be like, yeah, everyone just has the same skill. Cause like, we just don't have, like, this is not a course that's going to emphasize any of the skills that we look at week to week. Um, so like, that would be like the extreme case. But yeah, since we did kind of think an adjustment needed to be made just because, yeah, like there's multiple par threes that are over 250. Um, so like right away, we know that like <clears throat> players are going to be hitting like two to three more shots from 200 yards and over. So yeah, that, that stuff we can make slight adjustments from. Um, but yeah, so that adding all that up, we're not really, I mean, our predictions, we like, we like Scotty <laughs> to win, I guess. Right. Um, which isn't that, that's not that unique. Um, so yeah, we really like him. So yeah, Scotty Scheffler to win. And then we like Xander a lot as well, just because I think he's kind of coming in under the radar. Maybe he hasn't won in a while, but he's playing like really, really good. Um, and I think his worst finish in like six U S opens is like T 14. So he has a really good history of U S opens, which kind of makes sense. Just like his demeanor, the way his, like, just the way you think of him, he's like a pretty unflappable, I would say. Again, that stuff can matter. It might not. Um, but yeah, so we like Xander. He's kind of like the top guy that we that we like, and we also like we like Ricky kind of for the same reasons. Just hasn't won, but just like he's stringing together like week after week, really solid results. And both Ricky and Xander they they play well in majors typically, so uh, they're Excellent. getting a little bump from that. So my understanding is Scotty Scheffler has struggled with putting but putting tends to be more random than the other elements. I think the other five elements that you mentioned. So is that, I mean, is that kind of accounted for in, in your model or is just overall the model says that Scotty's the best and should be the favorite? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's accounted for. It's, it's, it's interesting because, so let's say someone is like playing completely average, but they're putting insanely well. Like they keep putting and like, like, so like there's their overall strokes gained is quite good, but it's all coming from putting. We won't give them as much credit in a predict, like in our rankings, they'll get full credit for their strokes gained because our rankings, we want to make sure that those are like pretty, like kind of backward looking in that sense. Like we're not going to okay. punish someone based on how they gain their shots in our right. rankings, just because I don't, that doesn't really gel with what rankings are. But in terms of our predictions going forward, we will down, like we'll, take away some of the or not take away but like we'll downgrade his skill a little bit because he's kind of gaining his strokes in a more unsustainable way and i think right. a good way to think of it is like i'm like a decent golfer i'm not good by any stretch like i played growing up but like so i could go out and i could easily like on a one-off day i could putt better than rory not easily but it could happen Right. Like, cause it's, there's just such a random nature to it. Whereas under no circumstance would I ever come close to beating Rory in like off the tee or like driving. So right. there's some skills that are just more sustainable than others. And when, so when we're, we're predicting for the current week, if you're gaining your strokes in a very sustainable way, we'll kind of give you credit for that. And then if you're just putting really well, just, yeah historically you can't sustain a really high level of putting uh for very long so we, we just don't right. give it as much credit but that's we've run into problems with that because some guys are actually really good putters like jason day or like brant snedeker so mm -hmm. it's it's kind of if brant snedeker keeps putting well <clears throat> we can't really treat him differently than someone who's putting well for like five months and then he, right. it is actually just kind of luck for him, but like Snedeker is actually just a good putter, which is so right. rare to have like a genuinely like great putter who just keeps on uh, putting well. So it, it, it can get a bit tricky. Um, but yeah, so for Scotty, it's actually the opposite, which is so because he's, he's hitting the ball like remarkably well, like basically as good as Tiger did. Wow. Um, and not in two, maybe not in 2000, but like um, in 2006, I think it was. Tiger, yeah, Tiger's best season in like the strokes gained era was 2006. 
and he was gaining like over three strokes tee to green and Scotty's gaining three strokes right now, like 3.00 tee to green wow. in 2023, but he has negative putting. So we're actually kind of expecting because the natural randomness of putting, we're just assuming that Scotty putting will improve somewhat so it's actually we're giving him like a positive bump because he's been putting poorly which yeah sure. again it, it kind of gets like is it random or is he actually like is there something wrong and he's going to keep putting poorly it's it's nothing huge but like we do make these slight adjustments um right yeah i guess to answer your question we do expect scotty to to his yeah. putting will improve at somewhat i assume yeah so that so that's point. definitely in the model you also talked about how you give players like Brooks Kepka a little bit of a major majors bump. Uh, I'm sure you see that that is actually predictive when you back test it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we make sure. So that's why nothing is ever huge um, in terms of our actual. Like it's only like half a shot because when you go back and actually test it, like and and same as like course history. Like if someone is pre- being, is if someone like performs three strokes better per round at a certain course. Like that's just not going to be real in any, especially when you go back and like test it. It always comes to be like a fraction of a shot difference. But again, like Brooks, like we just can't get him anywhere near where the betting market has him. It's just like there's no, there's nothing we could do that wouldn't right. just be like an outright, yeah, just manual adjustment, which we try and not do just because we like to think of people using our stuff as like more like a baseline and like they can trust like, okay, I understand their process and this is what they're saying. Like I obviously like most people would agree. We're pretty low on Brooks. I think, um, I think most people would agree with that. So yeah, we don't, we don't make any like manual tweaks. Right. As a, as a data golf subscriber, you know, one of the things that I really like is you can look at your predictions versus every single sports book pretty much every single sports book out there. I don't know. You have a lot of them, at least all the major ones and certainly the sharp ones. And, you know, it was interesting to hear you talk about how you're making these adjustments for Brooks Koepka, uh in a major. And yet, you know, you're still pretty far off market, which, which I'm not saying is a problem, but it, it's just, it, it, it's nice to on your site, see that comparison. And then just know that, you know, we all know that these models aren't perfect. Right. And, um, you know, there's certainly people betting on things that that go beyond just just what the data says. But um, yeah, I, I do think the discrepancy. I mean, the discrepancy is pretty big. And you know, like you said, you you just can't make a big enough bump to catch where you know to get yeah, books unless, up to where the markets think. Unless we're like just throwing out non-major data, which honestly is like I don't know. It's like <laughs> right. so bizarre. What like, this has never happened before. So. <laughs> Uh, again, like the, as far as I know, like no one has done this for this long a period, which is like completely outperforming their non-major self. So yeah, maybe he is actually a completely different player. Like I'm sure he's going into this week thinking like, like he does not care what happened at the last live event he played in. Like he thinks it's completely irrelevant. And that's probably, I used to think he was like full of it, but yeah, maybe he's like so confident that at these majors and like this, these setups, he can just beat people really easily. Like I remember one time he said, like it was pretty far back, like pretty long ago. He's like, I feel like I only have to beat like four or five people. Like everyone else will just kind of like fall off and like four or five people will play really well. And I just need to beat those guys. And it's like, okay, like, but then he'll go to a PJ tour event and come or a live event and come like tied for 30th for like five weeks in a row. So yeah, we've never really seen this before. So I guess in it would be similar in like the NBA of like playoff versus non playoff or regular season where there's just like this big change in how people play. And like, I don't know, I'm not a huge basketball I guy, think, but there just seems to be like a, a difference. I think there's a difference, but I think if, uh, actually I don't, I don't want to be held to this. I, I think someone showed that that wasn't as huge of an effect. Okay. Right. Like the idea of like, a team just turning it on in the playoffs is not. Yeah, and the thing with golf as well is like you can't just like turn it on and turn like in basketball. I would guess like okay, we're actually just going to try harder on defense in the playoffs. So that's like a that's actually going to happen, and we're better at we have better defenders. So like our skill is going to rise because we're just we're like leaving it all out there. Whereas in golf, there's like 
there's not that strong of a correlation between like anyone who plays golf will know this like how hard you try or how much you care is almost like negatively correlated with how you actually play so interesting yeah there's not like a there's i think he's just like super confident and i do think there's like a course fit element that we're not capturing so like most majors kind of suit him just like the pars are good make middle of the green take right play for some reason that maybe that really like makes him comfortable and yeah he doesn't force anything I, yeah I, we thought about this a lot and like it's like yeah as you said yeah we're like pretty pretty low on him every week like the betting markets have him roughly like eight to nine eight percent to win and we mm-hmm. have, have him at three percent even eight percent right. is like that actually seems kind of low just if you're like a casual golf fan you're just like oh yeah no that oh, guy's yeah. gonna like He's like 50% <laughs> to win. <laughs> but like, yeah. yeah, so, but yeah, we're, all, we're low on other guys too, especially at majors, like the top guys get, uh, they get more attention, uh, just like the Spieth, Mickelson, mm-hmm. Tiger when he plays. So like majors, we're usually low on guys. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's been, we don't, it doesn't bother us as much anymore just because like, right. I think everyone understands that like Brooks is a true like right. anomaly in that sense. Uh, and back yeah. in the day, like before we had a major adjustment, it was kind of like, why aren't, like, why isn't something, <laughs> something needs to be done. Here. Right. Like we have right, Brooks right. like 1% to win and he goes out and just like <laughs> bludgeons the field <laughs> and wins. Right, by, like, right, right. Like when you look back at it and it's like, there's no way that guy wasn't like at least 10% to win. Right. But that's just, yeah. I've done some work on uh, <clears throat> college basketball and whether teams that are not good at defense in the regular season do better in the tournament simply by effort. You would expect their effort to be greater. Mm-hmm. I did not find that to be an effect. So, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, something yeah, it else. Seems like most things on. in in like sports doesn't. When you actually go back and look at it, it doesn't. If it does come through, it's like really messy and like right. Yeah, there's yeah. like a very small difference that like and like the average fan would think nothing. Is or like they'd be like, yeah, there's like point one of a shot effect. Right. Yeah, Whereas exactly the people are thinking there's like a completely. Like there's like a shift in performance. Yeah. Well, you do a lot of great data visualizations on the site. They are all interactive. One of the ones that you did was looking at who overperforms in majors. And we've obviously talked about Brooks. Uh, I thought it was interesting that like Will Zell Torres almost had as much of a deviation in majors. Uh, obviously, there's a smaller sample size there because he's a younger golfer. Uh, but he has also done really well, right? Yeah, he has. I don't know... How many rounds? I think he's played like 12 or 13 rounds in majors. So not anywhere near as many as Brooks. But yeah, he's the only guy who's actually like up there because like it's it's interesting because like Scotty Scheffler, his major strokes, championship strokes gained, again, kind of a smaller sample. It's better than Brooks. But the thing is, is Scotty's good all the time. All the like time. He's, right. he's really, <laughs> whereas Brooks is just like, yeah, he's just completely out to lunch. He's like an average PGA Tour player. Not average, but maybe like top 20 PGA Tour player. And then he shows up to majors and all of a sudden he's like, he's like Scotty Scheffler. He's like Rory. Right. Like guys who are just there week in, week out. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it is an interesting viz. It's interesting like how we do these visualizations and you never know. Like sometimes <clears throat> they just come together and they're like really insightful. Mm-hmm. But like most data visualizations, like, to be frank, like they kind of suck just in like, you're just kind of searching for something that's not there. I find, uh, but then the, the odd time you put it down and it it really, really works and it highlights stuff much more than like just a table of data ever could. But yeah, yeah, it's the the Homa thing as well is on here. So yeah, he's like on the PGA tour, he's better than Brooks and just in like strokes gain Mm -hmm. perspective. And Brooks is three shots better than him. (laughs) in majors so <laughs> right it's like or two and a half uh yeah it just goes back to that question of like what's going on with brooks and then uh yeah and then like tiger is just so tiger is still the best player in majors but he's okay. like he had he didn't overperform in majors he's just like he's just that good so right and that's the other yeah, data it's really visual- just yeah okay go ahead oh i was just gonna say that's the other data visualization that i wanted to talk about because you have um 
let's see, I think it's something it'll be like you plot like how much better than average a player is going into a major. And then with with the number of um with the number of times that they've actually won a major. And all the I mean, it was basically a plot showing how good Tiger Woods was back in his prime, right? Like he was like all the yeah. the the, <clears throat> the the outlier points out in the wings was Tiger, right? He was that much better in the field and 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 he won a major. Yeah, it's hard to create any like backward looking plot that doesn't end up just showcasing how much better Tiger was than everyone else. Um, but yeah, so he's, it's kind of, yeah, it's because when, when we would watch Tiger growing up or like just anyone watching him, like you kind of just felt like he was <clears throat> not getting lucky, but like players were just like melting around him in a way. Mm-hmm. Whereas in reality, he was just like so much better than everybody else. Like, I don't even think we can comprehend now, like thinking back to how good Tiger was in 2000 versus like the guys he was playing against. It's like, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. I, I, it would have been interesting to have. We have done it. I just forget just to know like what his probability would have been okay. going into like those 2000 majors. <clears throat> Was it uh, better just, than better than 50%? Uh, I don't think so. we have kind of looked at it. At, at, uh, I don't think it was better than 50. No, no, it couldn't have been. Um, okay. But it was like, <clears throat> was really high. Like The only thing we see like similar today is when like John Rom would play in like the Mexico Open or something, uh, mm-hmm. like right. Just where like there, there's truly just like one or two guys there, and then right. you can get someone up to like fifteen to twenty percent to win quite easily. Uh, but John yeah, on that another- plot though, sorry, yeah, on that plot like Brooks, he's like it just he's won I guess five majors now, and yeah, his estimated skill going into each one is never very good. <clears throat> <laughs> right. So he right. It's kind of like, yeah, it's just strange. You'd think that like the further, the worse you are going in. Oh yeah. Anyway, you just have to kind of look at it to know what I'm talking about. But yeah, yeah Brooks, Brooks's squares are just scattered in like all of these random guys who won one major, but then he's right. sitting, he's won four from like unlikely positions. Right. Kind of a sign the model might need some, uh, <laughs> the Brooks Kepka adjustment might need to be bigger. For sure. Well, you brought up uh, John Rahm and, how much of a favorite that he was, uh, you know, over worse fields. I believe maybe about a year ago, Rom was by far the best golfer in your numbers and considered the best golfer in the world. It looks like he's fallen off a little bit from there. So what's going on with the Spaniard? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say he's really fallen off as much as just Scotty is like elevated and okay. like Rory as well at the beginning of the year. Um, yeah, I mean, Rom is maintained, I would say. He's just looking at his profile now. Yeah, he's a little bit worse off the tee. I don't know why that is. It looks like he's a little bit less accurate this year, which makes sense with what we've seen. He's kind of been struggling with his driver. Um, yeah, a little bit shorter and a little bit less accurate. He's still like a good driver of the ball, but right. nothing, um, not like he was in 2022. Um, yeah, no, he has one in majors, so... <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, not it's like he's like, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, I guess, Scott is getting a lot of headlines just because of just how like freakishly good he's been hitting the ball. But yeah. Rom is like a really solid putter. Uh, so yeah, he's not doing quite as much tee to green as, as Scheffler is. But yeah, he's still playing quite well. I would say, actually, let me just check. We have him as like two and a half shots better than an average PJ Tour player. Mm-hmm. And at this point last year, he was. Oh, not very, just two. Yeah, so maybe maybe it was in, in like the fall where he really went on his run. Okay. Yeah, no, I okay, would say so like, he, yeah, I would say he hasn't really fallen off just because, yeah, I would just notice his approach play is really good as well. So, okay. yeah, I, I think right. it's mostly just Rory and Scotty have kind of elevated themselves alongside more than a fall off. Okay. Well, you guys started uh, a newsletter, uh this this past year so tell us uh on your site so so what's in the newsletter and when why'd you decide to start doing that oh yeah that's actually tough uh why did we start the newsletter yeah we kind of ask ourselves that every week as we're trying to get it out um yeah no the newsletter is just a way of like kind of getting our stuff out there without without being on twitter not that twitter's bad or anything but just yeah just a different way to 
to put stuff out there. It can be a bit longer and we can kind of put a bit more thought into it. Um, yeah, and we try and make it really short as well. It's just kind of like a quick recap of like who won last week, what their strokes gain numbers were, if, were there any like movements in our rankings. And then we try and do like a, a more thoughtful section each week, which might be like a, a simple graph or more like just like a preview of a major or something like that. Um, but yeah, there's really no reason <laughs> that we started it. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I guess we just thought that that this like medium suited us better than like, we don't tweet much. We don't like market much ourselves very much. So it's just like a different way to, to get our content out there. Uh, and yeah, who knows? It might, not, <laughs> it might not be around for too much longer, but we've gone, we've done every week this in 2023 we've gotten a newsletter out so yeah we've kind of gotten the groove of it um and yeah it's just a different way to to reach out to people i like it a lot like you said it's short you get some quick insights (laughs) doesn't take you that long to read hopefully it's driving people to subscribe to your site so maybe tell everyone what do you guys still call it scratch plus uh yeah just scratch was like our basic okay so uh, what what do you get with a scratch scratch membership Uh, yeah, so basically like 90 to 95% of our site is free. And then, so if you subscribe, you get access to like our full odd screen, which shows our prediction, like our, basically our like fair price or something, our model's price. And then you can see every sports book next to it or not everyone, but like, as you said, like the main U S ones and like a few, uh, offshore and then like UK books. Um, and yeah, you just get access to basically all the like ins and outs of our model and what goes into the predictions each week um and then just like little things here and there just like to make the site we do make it slightly less convenient to be like to be roaming the site and not being a paid member um so yeah you just kind of get full access and then yeah you get access to like everything to do with our model in terms of our outright prices matchup prices all that kind of stuff um yeah that's probably the biggest marketing <laughs> push I've ever done on our site. But uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> well, it's just like standard stuff. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I am a subscriber. I really like exactly what you mentioned, looking at your odds compared to, to every sports book. And it's a tool that I that I definitely use. So thank you for, for doing that. Yeah. Uh, well, we'd love to end with some uh, potentially non-sports questions. What's your favorite book? Yeah, I couldn't really think about this. Uh, I knew ahead of time because Matt had told me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, honestly, I'm going to go with, it's kind of sad, but it might be Tiger Woods, How I Play Golf. I just read that book a thousand times. <laughs> oh, wow. He had like this amazing book when I was growing up. It was right beside my bed. And I would just like, if I like hit my irons bad that day, I would just go and read his entire chapter on like how he, he hits irons. And like looking back, he probably didn't even write the book. <laughs> someone else probably wrote it and just put his like name on it but yeah it's like a really good book before like youtube uh-huh. and stuff. Like, there were no like golf tips on youtube or anything so yeah there was like this like frame by frame thing or like photo like photos sequence of like his swing oh wow yeah, it's like it's like am i like bible i guess growing <laughs> growing up i just read that thing endlessly um was that a yeah like, non- kind of a was that like a bestseller Sorry. back in the day? Like every, <laughs> I don't every know. aspiring uh, golfer yeah, I don't know. has her hands on it? I think it was like pretty popular. It was like a big like hardcover book with like pictures. It wasn't like a, like Ben Hogan's, like his book I know is more like text. Uh, but yeah, it was just like a, I would say it's just like a bit ahead of its time maybe in terms of like what people were looking for in terms of golf instruction. Um, How good of yeah, a golfer was, were you back in your prime? uh yeah well, for both of us like our prime was probably like 16 um just in terms of like that's when like you're not really thinking about much golf is very free um we're still like i was still improving um but yeah like pretty good i would say like um like in our we grew up just outside ottawa in canada and yeah we were like the best like two of the five to six best juniors in the area um yeah we were like like I won the, our, our men's club championship when I was like 15. So yeah, like we were like good, but then golf is so weird. Like I'm like exponentially worse now uh, just because. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's 
we both kind of have our own unique situation in terms of why. But yeah, mentally, I think once you kind of lose it, it's kind of it's gone. And like the harder you try and even now, I think like just how do I get back? But like you can't even like you see it with like Jordan Spieth even like he's talked about this a lot in terms of like I'm never going to get back to my 2015 self. And like I, I've realized that and like he's kind of just accepted it and moved on. But like a more sad case would be like Smiley Kaufman or David Duvall, where they just don't play anymore. Uh, that you were like a like you win a PG, you go from winning a PJ Tour event to like not being able to break eighty. It's pretty like it's not it's probably not mechanical. It's just like you just kind of lose it. And I think it's kind of what makes golf great, but also just in like the mental side, but also what makes it like pretty painful. Uh, but yeah, in short, we were like pretty good but nothing like we weren't like prodigies or anything but enough that we were like we were good enough that like our obsession with like sustained itself through like our teenage years so like, we didn't get bored of it like we we were playing a lot of tournaments and stuff very nice and this this mental aspect is is really interesting right because you know it's kind of like the decline coming from the mental side of things and we kind of discussed earlier how maybe it's the mental side that's giving Brooks Cup an, an edge every time it's a major right so it's really the psychology that seems really important in this game yeah it's like, it's like self-fulfilling to, or like it's, a, it's like a feedback loop positive or negative like when I first kind of like for me I just stopped hitting the ball as solid like you can really flush a golf ball like and it kind of feels like everyone knows that feeling who's played golf where just like you just feel like you mash it basically you're just compressing the ball a lot and i was just like not compressing it anymore and then i didn't know it was nothing. mental i just thought i thought i was just like a physical like oh i'm just not like i don't know who knows like i just need to like take it back this way because i'd never experienced such a weird phenomenon before and then you think it's meant you think it's physical but it's actually maybe mental like maybe i'm just like kind of flinching or i'm like i'm not committing to like swinging through the ball and that but then mental becomes physical and then it's like matt would be like well like yeah your swing does look worse because like mental does bleed into physical and then you start hitting it even worse and then your mental condition (laughs) gets even worse after that and then before you know it like you don't even know what weighs up when i'm like looking at the ball now it's like i just feel like i'm kind of lost in a way i mean i still can play well sometimes but like you just kind of feel lost but like for brooks is probably or even like DJ or anyone like on the PJ tour, like they just, all they know is like absolutely obliterating the ball and like compressing it and hitting drives 300 yards with no spin. Like that's just all they know. Like they, they don't even understand. Like when they play with amateurs, they must be like, like what are you doing? Like your swing doesn't even look that bad, but like you just like suck. <laughs> and I can't really, they, I don't think they really know why. Like I, it's like, Cause like, I don't think, cause PJ tour players don't even get much better. Like they're all on the range, just like beating balls nonstop. But like you look at their trend, like they're moving averages on our site and like, like Patrick Rogers turned pro, like he's the same age as me, like just under 30. And he hasn't gotten a stroke better or worse since he turned pro like 10 years ago. So it's like, but he's just hit millions of golf balls. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if these guys know why they're good or if they have like these secrets. I I kind of think they're just like naturally really gifted at hitting a ball, and then yeah, like the, that they think they they have like these triggers. Like like Harris English, I remember watching a video of him saying like, yeah, I just really focus on like making sure I'm like standing in a certain way at a dress like before I start my swing, and it's like okay, but like that or like yeah, like keeping posture. In his, during his back swing, which like it, again it matters but like it doesn't right. like i can do that and it's still gonna be a horrible shot so it's like i think everyone just has these triggers that kind of get their head in like a certain space that allows them to be super free um Interesting. yeah this is like an inside look and yeah i don't even, <laughs> this is just like my thoughts on golf uh everyone's completely different obviously it's like the reason we like this game I presume that you had more time to practice golf when you were in your teens and less time later as your, your game declined in your twenties. Right. So do you feel like that impacted the mental side of your game? Uh, no, no. In short, no, I I don't think if, if anything now, like I play better after I don't play for a while, just cause like I can kind of get so engrossed in the whole thing. And like, um, 
Yeah, I don't think so. No, when I, I was still playing a lot when I started kind of not playing as well. So, yeah, I think it's just something that like everyone, like there's a bunch of juniors in the world going through and not saying I was on this level at all, but like like the best juniors that Jordan Spieth played against when he was 12, 13, 14. I'm sure a lot of them just fell off or like they, for some reason or another, they just stopped improving. But Jordan Spieth, and so they got yeah, the guys on the PJ Tour are just the ones who like just somehow kept improving even after like they grew into their bodies. And like by the time you're like 17, 18, like you're hitting the ball pretty far. Like you're not going to have that many more gains from just hitting it further. So like somehow you need to keep improving. Uh, and yeah, the, the PJ Tour guys are just the ones who somehow kept doing it. Uh, and I can't, who knows why coaching luck. Yeah. It's, it's weird. That's fascinating. I mean, do you feel, do you feel like that happens in most sports? Like if you're a basketball player, right. And I mean, there's all kinds of problems with the way we raise basketball players in this country, but you know, you get into your twenties and some people keep improving and some don't. Right. And so there's, I mean, you know, there, I mean, there's, there's an aspect of athleticism there too, which I don't know if, if if there's you feel like there's the same in golf but you know some some guys like you know the Gabe Vincents of the world of the Miami Heat like kind of keep improving and become like you know keep getting keep playing whereas I'm sure there was a lot of players that were above his level I'm just thinking the Miami Heat player because I've been thinking about the finals a lot you know there's probably a lot of players when he was 22 and graduating from college that were way ahead of his level right so and and that have fallen off similar to what you were just saying with the golfers. So do you feel like that happens in every sport? Yeah. I, I golf is the only thing I have any kind of like personal experience in. I mean, maybe in other sports because there's like, you're not just like you're competing against like other people who are also getting better. Like maybe you could be really good against a certain type of like, if it, if a defender is like bad enough, you can like really, manipulate something but as the level gets higher like you're what you were really good at kind of gets like negated by better defending there might be something like that where and like there's like team aspects as well where like maybe like I, I, i'm thinking about baseball for some reason but like yeah like maybe the, at some point you just reach a, like when the pitcher just gets good enough where it's like i just i don't really have that same like edge anymore for some reason maybe whereas in golf you don't really have that although you kind of do with like the course the courses get harder as you get get older um and you like you progress through and that could be why you don't see some guys like peter uline was like a really good amateur and like a mediocre pro he could barely hang on to a or he didn't hold on to his pj tour card before he joined live and yeah his skill set seemed to be like like he could destroy college fields quite easily i think just because he was such a good iron player. He didn't have to hit driver very much. But as the level got higher, like you need to be able to hit driver pretty consistently. Uh, and I just, it's not really a skill that he has. So yeah, there could be some of that going on as well, where you can just rely on certain things. But as everyone gets better, you need to be more well-rounded or something. Right. But yeah, it's, yeah I'm, I, I really, I'm not sure. No, it's interesting. Interesting to talk about. Well, how about your best culinary experience? Uh, like my like a one off or like <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I don't know a restaurant you like. Uh, okay, time that you uh, were out eating something with your brother and decided to start a day of golf. I don't know wh- whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, we don't usually go to dinner together. <laughs> <laughs> business <laughs> enough of them is mostly day. business. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, keeping it in golf, I guess, is like it's just too golf oriented but yeah eating like a club sandwich and fries from like a clubhouse after a round of golf like an evening in the summer on like the patio you, i don't know you can't get much better than that i guess uh you probably could in terms of the food but the overall <laughs> feeling is yeah good <laughs> well that that definitely makes the food taste better uh if you could have dinner with any one person dead or alive who would it be uh yeah <laughs> Oh, I try. I got to think of something outside of golf. Uh, you don't have to. Honestly, I think my one dinner it might be like, uh, it could, it could be someone like Smiley Kaufman, maybe. Just like I just okay. wanted want to know, like, like what do you feel? Okay. 
like go, standing over the ball, like as someone who is that good at golf and is like, but yeah, I don't really need to have dinner with them. I could just, <laughs> that would be a quicker conversation. That, no, the, but that, uh, you know, that's yeah, a... but yeah, I, I just probably can't imagine many people have said Smiley Kaufman to that, to that question, but yeah. Pretty Smiley sure Kaufman you're the first like, on my uh, show. Yeah. Anyone. Yeah. yeah. Anyone who's like been really good at golf, won a PJ tour event and then had to quit in the next like couple of years. It would be a fascinating to talk to them. Awesome. Well, of course, Shane, thank you so much for your time this week before the U S open, please let everyone know where they can find you on the internet and where they can get your services at data golf. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah. So Absolutely. our website is data Uh, and then on Twitter, we're just at data golf, not on Instagram or anything else. So yeah. Hardcore. Uh, I I'm not on Instagram either. Yeah, just Too we, much of a we, time suck. I don't know. I just I don't know if it's just like golf is on Twitter and like I don't know is there a golf community on Instagram? I actually honestly don't really know. Uh, but yeah, we just we just Twitter and then datagolf.com. and then yeah, our newsletter. Subscribe to our newsletter. That's one thing I will shamelessly plug. Awesome. No, and, and I highly <laughs> recommend it. Uh, just started. I just subscribed this week, even though I've been a, a subscriber of a paying member of the site for a while. Um, is there is there like a quick link? I, I know there's like a tab on datagolf.com, but it's it's uh, it's on the site, right? Yeah, if you go to like there's an, there's a newsletter like archive on our homepage, and if you go there, you can subscribe from there. Okay. Yeah, in Perfect. true data golf fashion, it's actually pretty hard. It's a bit of an accomplishment to actually subscribe. So, <laughs> yeah, it's there. It was it was <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I just had to click through one captcha. It wasn't it wasn't too yeah. bad. <laughs> Will, thanks again. This is Ed Fang, your host for the Football Analytics Show. I really hope you enjoyed that interview with Will Corshane as much as I enjoyed talking with him. I think they have so many good insights about golf and how to do predictive analytics for a very difficult sport. And I hope someday that my two boys will work together as brothers as well as he and his brother do. Just a reminder, you can get my free sports betting email newsletter every Saturday. I send out Five Nuggets Saturday with some bets and some analytics and some humor. You can check this out at thepowerrank.com. Once again, my name is Ed Fang. I'm honored to be your host for the Football Analytics Show podcast. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end, and I will talk to you again soon. Mm